Hello and welcome to this video about the Forced Labor Convention number 29 and its protocol. These are two fundamental ILO instruments. Although forced labor is universally condemned and prohibited in the legislation of most countries, forced labor practices persist all over the world and still need to be addressed. The ILO estimates that worldwide almost 28 million people are in forced labor, performing work involuntarily or under threat. Among these victims, 6.3 million are victims of sexual exploitation. Several economic sectors are affected, including domestic work, construction, manufacturing, agriculture, and fishing. Victims often work hidden from public view and are difficult to identify and protect. As a consequence, many perpetrators go unpunished. Forced labor generates billions in illicit profits each year. Industries and businesses face unfair competition and states lose billions in tax incomes and social security contributions. The first instrument adopted by the ILO that addresses forced labor is Convention Number no. 29. This convention was adopted in 1930 and has been widely ratified. Thus, the elimination of forced labor has been a core concern of the ILO since its very early history. Convention number 29 contains the obligation for states to suppress the use of forced labor in all its forms. But how is forced labor defined by the convention? Convention number 29 defines it as any work or service exacted under the menace of a penalty and for which the person has not offered voluntarily. It is important to stress that this definition remains valid nowadays. The definition contains three elements. For a situation to be qualified as forced labor, these three elements must be present. What is the first element? All work and service refers to any type of work, service or employment occurring in any activity, industry or sector, including in the informal economy. The status of the person or uh, the formality of the employment relationship is irrelevant. It also encompasses activity that may be illegal or not considered as work in certain countries, such as begging or prostitution. If a person is compelled to beg, the person should be considered as a victim of forced labor and not as a person committing an offense. Forced labor can occur in both the public and private sectors. The second element refers to the menace of a penalty. The menace of a penalty should be understood in a very broad sense. For example, it can cover penal sanctions provided for in the legislation that could be applied to persons if they do not undertake compulsory work. It covers also a wide range of means of coercion used to compel someone to perform work against their will, physical violence, threats or retaliation, denunciation to authorities, etc. The menace of a penalty may also involve the loss of a right or an advantage. The third element is the lack of consent. In the definition, the term not offered himself herself voluntarily refers to workers not having given their consent to enter in an employment relationship. The consent given uh, must be considered as a valid consent. This implies a free and informed consent without uh, cohesion or threats. The consent to work must exist throughout the labor relationship. As a consequence, workers must be able to withdraw their consent at any time. It is therefore vital that the competent authorities pay special attention to the means used by an employer to keep a person in forced labor. These elements will uh, invalidate the consent that was initially given and are indicators of a forced labor situation. Deception of false promises, withholding and non-payment of wages, retention of identity documents, induced indebtedness. Are there any situations in which the state can impose compulsory labor? The answer is yes, absolutely. 
Convention 29 provides for exceptions to the definition of forced labor that we have just reviewed. It specifically refers to five situations in which compulsory labor might be imposed. Work imposed under compulsory military service. However, to be considered as not constituting forced labor, work imposed must be used for purely military ends, normal civil obligations, as well as work imposed on convicted persons. This exception refers to compulsory prison labor or the penalty of community work. To be accepted as an exception to forced labor, the work imposed must be carried out under the supervision of a public authority and not benefiting private entities. Moreover, work exacted in cases of emergency is not considered as forced labor. For example, in case of wars or natural calamities. For this exception, there is also a limitation. The power to call up labor must cease as soon as the circumstances that endanger the population or its normal living conditions no longer exist. Another exception is minor communal services. The work required relates primarily to maintenance work and must be decided by the community or its representatives and be realized in the direct interest of the community. As we can see, each of these exceptions is subject to the observance of certain conditions that limit their scope. What should be done by states to combat forced labor under the Convention? First of all, states must adopt specific legislation that criminalizes practices of forced labor and provide for criminal penalties for those who impose forced labor. It is essential that the legislation properly defines what constitutes forced labor practices and that the law enforcement bodies receive training in this regard to be able to identify such practices. In view of the gravity of the crime, penal sanctions must be really adequate and dissuasive. Moreover, measures need to be taken to ensure that the penal sanctions provided for by the legislation are strictly enforced. To that end, the competent authorities must have adequate resources and receive training to be able to identify situations of forced labor, investigate cases, and prosecute perpetrators. When found guilty, those who impose forced labor should be convicted and victims compensated. Is prosecution sufficient to put an end to forced labor? Criminalizing and punishing are key in the fight against forced labor, but they are not sufficient. It has become obvious that states need to adopt a holistic approach to combat forced labor practices and adopt dedicated policies and strategies. The focus should not be only on prosecution, but also on prevention and protection of victims. In 2014, the ILO adopted a new instrument that supplements Convention 29, a protocol to it. The protocol reaffirms that measures of prevention, protection and remedies are necessary to achieve the effective and sustained suppression of forced labor. Let's give examples of these measures mentioned. The protocol requires states to develop and adopt a national policy and a plan of action to combat forced labor with systematic action being taken by the competent authorities for their implementation. This implies the establishment of a competent entity responsible for the coordination of the measures taken by the different actors involved in the implementation of the action plan. In relation to measures aimed at preventing the use of forced labor, the protocol sets forth an overall strategy. It outlines a number of specific measures that members must put in place in several areas, including awareness raising and education, protection from abusive and fraudulent recruitment practices, in particular concerning migrant workers, due diligence by the public and private sectors, measures to address the root causes of forced labor. Finally, protection measures. Victims must be placed at the center of the efforts to combat forced labor. Victims need first to be properly identified by the authorities and removed from situations of forced labor. 
The protocol also requires states to take effective measures for the protection, recovery, and rehabilitation of victims. This implies short, medium, and long-term measures in relation to accommodation, healthcare, social and economic assistance, protection of the identity and safety of victims, etc. In practice, many victims of forced labor face legal and other obstacles that prevent them from accessing remedies. The protocol specifically requires states to take measures to ensure that victims have access to appropriate remedies, such as compensation, irrespective of their presence or legal status in a national territory. Furthermore, victims of forced labor should not be prosecuted or punished for their involvement in activities which they have been compelled to commit. In conclusion, forced labor is not a phenomenon from the past. Also, it has Asian roots in history. Forced labor practices exist today in many different forms and in all regions of the world. It is essential for all stakeholders to acknowledge that such practices exist. Systematic action from governments in consultation with the employers and workers coordination between uh, the relevant national entities and cooperation between countries are key to put an end to this couch. Mm -hmm.